Okay. I have the great privilege today at lunchtime, now that you're all fed, I have the great pri privilege of introducing my colleague and friend, Attorney Gen General Eric T. Schneiderman, New York's highest ranking law enforcement officer. He has long been an advocate of smarter, more effective approaches to fighting crime, and his whole career has been about the pursuit of justice in our state and in our nation. All New Yorkers are proud of his unswerving dedication and commitment to equal justice and the rule of law. Before becoming Attorney General, he was widely praised as a reformer, as a public interest lawyer, as a private practitioner, and as a member of our New York State Senator. Senate. As a senator, he led reforms of the state's draconian Rockefeller drug laws. He has also helped to enact tough laws to root out fraud against taxpayers. As Attorney General, Eric Schneiderman has pursued the prosecution of corruption, gone after companies that gouge victims after Hurricane Sandy, and taken on the big New York and national banks and their practices that contributed to our debilitating economic recession. He was appointed co-chair of the Residential Mortgage-Backed Securities Working Group by President Obama, and he led the national effort to secure a $16.7 billion settlement with Bank of America and a $13 billion settlement with J.P. Morgan Chase for their roles in the housing crisis. The national mortgage settlement money that New York received was used by the Attorney General to launch the Home Ownership Protection Program, which helps New Yorkers at risk of foreclosure to stay in their homes by providing housing counseling and desperately needed legal assistance. On criminal justice issues, he is an original and creative thinker in seeking the confidence and trust of the public in the justice system. He has been appointed by Governor Cuomo to be the special prosecutor for cases involving deadly police civilian encounters because of the singular respect and admiration in which he is held by the diverse communities in our state. Attorney General Schneiderman has also used funds recovered from drug traffickers to pay for bulletproof vests for local police departments and to pay for desperately needed medication to protect against heroin, heroin overdoses. And the Attorney General is dedicated in the fight to eradicate human trafficking in our state. As part of his office's initiative to combat sex and labor trafficking, the Attorney General has implemented a task force to investigate potential cases, prosecute, prosecute perpetrators, and connect survivors with service providers who specialize in their unique needs. The task force is a model for the country and ensures that trafficking matters are quickly investigated and prosecuted, and that civil, labor, and criminal claims are identified and pursued. Attorney General Schneiderman is in every sense a partner in justice for the judiciary and a leading voice in our state and the country in the fight for equal justice. I am so proud that he is the Attorney General of our state and to have him as my friend and collaborator in the battle, in the battle to ensure that all New Yorkers get their day in court including victims, the vulnerable and the exploited, and those without resources, status, or money in their pockets. It is my honor and privilege to introduce to you the 65th Attorney General of the State of New York, Eric T. Schneiderman. Thank you. Wow. That was the high point of my week, Your Honor. <clears throat> um, 
Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I am so pleased to see such a, an amazing turnout here and from so many different states all around the country. Uh, I want to thank the, uh, our colleagues in the court system, uh, our Chief Administrative Judge Marks and our great Chief Judge, uh, Jonathan Lippmann, who is one of the really true innovators and he's sort of the energizer bunny of innovators. Every time you go for a speech, you're hearing some new program no one has ever done before, some new experiment, and I'll talk about some of the work later in my remarks, but a great leader and a great friend to me, my office, and to really to, to the judiciary and to law enforcement all across the state. Um, I want to thank the State Justice Institute and its chair, Chief Justice Jim Hanna, for providing the grant that is funding this event, to all of the sponsors and partners who've made this possible. Uh, and I do want to note that uh, and welcome my colleagues, uh, some other attorneys general who are here. Some have come from far away. We have Attorney General uh, Owens from Georgia, uh, from Nebraska, Doug Peterson, and from North Dakota, Wayne Stenjim, from Guam, Elizabeth Barrett, I think probably the furthest travel of anyone to get here. Um, and I think John Hoffman was here earlier from New Jersey, which is an easier commute. Uh, but I really want to thank you all for being here and for your commitment to this issue. It's a great opportunity. Uh, the summit is really a, an unusual opportunity for leaders in criminal justice, law enforcement, the judiciary, advocates to share their expertise and to raise awareness about the nature and the scale and the scope of trafficking that has swept over America in the last few decades. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, every year millions of men, women, and children are trafficked uh, within their own countries and across international borders, yet human trafficking in some ways is still a poorly understood crime, both by the general public and, let us be honest, to some folks in law enforcement. Uh, part of, partly that's because human trafficking presents a lot of unique challenges for our police officers, for our prosecutors, and for our courts, um, often victims of Labor or sex trafficking are, are undocumented immigrants who are reluctant to cooperate with the authorities for fear of de deportation. In sex trafficking cases, victims often fear that they will be prosecuted for prostitution. Um, many trafficking victims are coerced, abused, some blackmailed. Uh, sometimes they start and then stop cooperating or give inconsistent statements over time about uh, the traffickers. And adding to the challenge, tragically, Victims of sex trafficking are often children. It's estimated that one in six missing children in the United States end up being trafficked for sex. And approximately one third of teen runaways are approached by sex traffickers within their first 48 hours on the street. So the difficulties associated with these cases are huge. Um, I think that uh, it's not a secret that uh, a lot of uh, Funding that was flowing from Washington for law enforcement programs has been cut back and that the, the gridlock and breakdown in Washington really has left us more and more on our own. So it's really appropriate that we're here as state actors um, taking on this challenge. We have to learn from each other. We have to work together. We have to model things for each other and make sure that the best practices uh, are shared widely in the, in the state courts among prosecutors and our law enforcement agencies. The, um, the first step to doing our jobs and to getting a handle on this crime wave and really uh, putting an end to it and get, making sure we have the best protocols in place all across America is that we really do have to do some, uh, it sounds funny from law enforcement, we have to do some consciousness change. We have to do some consciousness raising. A lot of folks still don't quite have the right frame for trafficking. And the analogy I make sometimes is, 50 years ago, police officers would almost never bust up a fight between a husband and a wife. They, the consciousness has shifted on the issue of domestic violence so radically, not just by accident or because of a change in the weather, but because advocates and advocacy groups sought to change public awareness of it. And they understand that these are not just family matters that law enforcement should stay out of. And we have now a whole new set of protocols. And really, it's true all over the United States. Law enforcement has completely shifted the way it approaches domestic violence instances, instances of, of domestic violence. We have to do the same thing when it comes to trafficking. And uh, it's, it's up to us to do it. And I think that this summit is a great step forward. I've talked to 
some of the people here who say they've learned a lot. The most important thing is to help the public understand uh, the difference between a perpetrator and a victim and to understand the scope of trafficking and the often counterintuitive schemes of traffickers. So uh, let me share with you some of what we've done in New York, uh, led by our great chief judge, but there been, there's been a great, there also is a great advocacy community here in New York, I do have to give them a shout out, that has been doing this work to raise public awareness of trafficking um, and, oh, for, for years and years and with significant results uh, as I will discuss. Um, we have in New York a unique system uh, because the advocates and their allies in government have uh, undertaken really to make dramatic shifts over the last decade and in addition to the chief judge who transformed the way New York deals with trafficking cases when he created the first ever statewide system of human trafficking intervention courts which I'll discuss in more tail, detail below. Um, another great ally uh, represented here Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance who created a human trafficking response unit that is housed in the Manhattan Family Justice Center and includes social workers. Um, I'll talk about the work of my office that, is, that has been transformed over the last few years. But these, none of these transformations happened overnight. Uh, the advocacy community mobilized really effectively and in, in the New York State Legislature, which is often a hard place to get things done. And our first major step forward as a state was in 2007. I was still serving as a state senator, and I'm proud to have been a part of this effort. We passed the New York State Human Trafficking Act, creating some of the strongest and most comprehensive anti-trafficking policies in the nation. We drastically increased penalties for trafficking and created an interagency human trafficking task force that on an ongoing basis uh, recommends and promotes best practices. And perhaps most importantly, we started treating coercion either by the threat of violence, the promise of jobs, money, or drugs as the serious crime that it is for the first time. Then in 2008, again, working with our allies in the advocacy community, we passed a safe harbor law that transformed how our justice system treats some of the most vulnerable victims of trafficking, uh, children charged with prostitution-related defenses. The law created a process to divert these victims away from the delinquency proceedings in the, the uh, system for juvenile justice into supportive services and authorized the creation of safe houses that accept, house, and provide treatment to sexually exploited youth. In 2010, we took it further by becoming the first state to enact legislation that provides victims of sex trafficking an appeals process to vacate convictions of prostitution-related offenses. Tremendously important because, as you all know, you have to get cooperation uh, from the victims, and if they fear law enforcement, um, they're not going to cooperate. But this was a very uh, unique and successful effort. And, and then followed up uh, by our great chief judge who announced two years ago our network of human trafficking intervention courts, the first statewide system dedicated, uh, and as it says in the, they say in the, the title, to intervene in the lives of trafficking victims. And now in New York, all prostitution-related offenses continuing past arraignment are transferred to these trafficking intervention courts which help to connect defendants to services including sheltering, shelter, education, drug treatment, and job training. Uh, if a defendant completes court-mandated services, their charges can be reduced or dismissed altogether. And finally, this, this past legislative session earlier this year, uh, the Senate and Assembly passed the Trafficking Victims Protection and Justice Act, which enhances penalties for sex and labor traffickers and significantly expands protective services for victims. And once again, none of this would have happened without the work of the advocacy community. And I know we have folks from Sanctuary for Families here today. Yeah, so we have a great advocacy community. Uh, I've often observed that any movement in American history, great movements that really changed our country, the abolition movement, the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, none of them were started by an elected official. Elected officials are very good at showing up at the end. So uh, you can look at 2007 as really sort of the culmination of a time when the advocates, and some advocates inside the government as well, um, succeeded in getting the, enough elected officials on, to, on the right track on this issue, had them reframe the way they saw trafficking, and started this process. But once it started uh, in New York, we just kept running with it. And I'm going to talk today about 
some new steps we're taking to advance the game even further. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, the, the consciousness shift was so dramatic in New York that our uh, police departments all over the state, and I tr travel all over the state, I have 15 offices around the state, the degree to which in the last number of years they've really internalized the understanding of trafficking and understood the critical distinction, which I'm going to dis discuss, of presumptively treating uh, trafficked laborers and sex workers as victims. Presumptively they're victims, not presumptively perpetrators. This is the shift in consciousness. So let me talk a little bit about the work that we've done since I became the Attorney General in 2011. Uh, I'm proud to say my office has been more engaged on these issues than ever before. We, uh, consulting experts in the field, adopted a victim-centered approach to combating human trafficking, which has three components. First, ascertaining the unique needs of trafficking victims because they vary significantly. You have to take the time to do that. Then taking those needs into account at each step of our investigation and prosecution of traffickers. So each investigative step has to be measured as to how it will affect the victims. And finally, shifting our focus, as I just said, so that absent especially compelling circumstances, we do not prosecute victims. Whenever my office breaks up a criminal operation that we believe may include victims of human trafficking, we now work with organizations with the expertise to ensure that the victims are properly identified and, when necessary, provided with a safe harbor and rehabilitative services. Um, we cooperate with the nonprofit sector here, and, other, and we have agencies that are designated by our Human Trafficking Task Force, which identifies best practices, but also uh, identifies agencies that can work together with those of us in law enforcement. Let me give you a few examples. During the first few months of my administration, 2011, my organized crime task force and the head of my criminal division, Kelly Donovan, is here, who uh, also supervises the great work of the task force. Uh, along with the New York City Police Department, opened an investigation into an advertising agency, uh, which we believe was promoting prostitution. And this was a remarkable company. It was like a full-service communication company. They would handle your TV, your internet, your online, booking ads, they gave us, except they only serviced uh, people who provided prostitution and drugs. So they were specialty advertising and communications enterprise. Um, our investigation spanned more than a year and re revealed that, that this was really, they were profiting very handsomely from this, from, and it was a ring that spanned this tri-state area. Uh, when we executed our arrest warrants for the leaders of this, we immediately identified two individuals who were, uh, happened, happened to be there when we made some arrests as people we believed to be trafficking victims. Uh, so we immediately referred them and brought in people from Sanctuary for Families. And we have followed ever since then the same set of protocols. We've developed our connections with counselors and with expertise. And in any uh, proceeding in which we encounter what people we believe to be trafficking victims, we bring in the experts. Um, in October 2013, uh, my, the Organized Crime Task Force uh, announced the arrest of the operators of a sex trafficking ring that stretched all across central New York, Syracuse, Watertown, Ithaca, and other small cities. The ringleaders preyed on women and girls as young as 15 years old, recruited them to work for sex, intimidated them with the use of physical force, and supplied them with cocaine, heroin, and MDMA to keep them ensnared. Very important to note, a lot of people think of trafficking as only being an international. This was a trafficking ring in central New York that was trafficking people from New York. So you don't have to look for victims from exotic places. It happens in our own towns and cities as well. And of, and, of course, instead of arresting the women uh, who were involved in this, we provided them with help and sanctuary. And last year, the top ringleader of this uh, trafficking um, uh, scheme pled guilty to violations of New York's sex trafficking law, one of the first successful prosecutions under that new statute. And he was sentenced to uh, more than six years in prison. Uh, finally, in, in January 2014, thank you. I clap for the lawyers who made that happen. Thank you. Um, in January 2014, we announced charges against 18 individuals for running a high-end prostitution and drug trafficking ring that was specifically catered to people coming to New York for the Super Bowl. Now, again, this is, this is the way traffickers operate and the way they think. When they see a big event, they often have the ability to migrate and move their trafficking victims to where they think there's going to be a lot of partying. Well, and we had the Super Bowl... Uh, over in the Meadowlands, a group set up here, 
and working with our colleagues uh, uh, across the river and with other law enforcement agencies, we managed to ensure that in all of the proceedings related to that ring, uh, the focus was exclusively on the ringleaders, pimps, drug traffickers who promoted cocaine and women to generate millions of dollars in illegal proceeds. No agency involved charged anyone for engaging in prostitution, and we worked once again with Sanctuary for Families to screen potential tra trafficking victims and to provide them with services. So I guess the way I would sum up our approach is that we really do believe in using every tool in the toolbox, and if the existing tools aren't enough, let's craft a new tool to see if we can solve the problem some other way. This is not, ladies and gentlemen, a time to be cautious in our approach to attacking the scourge of human trafficking. This is a time when we have to be willing to try things that have never been tried before. Um, we worked working with our organized crime task force. We uh, took all everything that we had learned in the context of organized crime and gang investigations and brought all of that to bear on trafficking rings. We successfully pushed for amendments to New York's wiretap statutes to add trafficking to the list of crimes for which wiretaps are allowed and we have not hesitated to use that tool in our investigations. But uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, even in a, in a state that has done this much, and where consciousness really has changed in, among pretty much most people in law enforcement, we need more tools to capture traffickers uh, as they increasingly turn to the internet to perpetrate their crimes. Uh, sex traffickers advertising their victims online are in a place where transactions can be anonymous, difficult to monitor, difficult to trace. Uh, some of these ads even picture children who've been reported missing and whose whereabouts are unknown. Recognizing this, my office has spent the past few months developing a new uh, innovative way to combat sex trafficking online, and I'm proud to announce today the result of that work. Starting today, my office is partnering with Facebook uh, to launch a new set of technology-driven investigative strategies that are going to enhance our ability to crack down on sex trafficking online. This is not my office's first... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that this is not my office's first uh, partnership with Facebook. And talking to some of my colleagues, I know they've, they've worked with uh, the Attorney General in, in, in Georgia as well. Um, we joined with them to shut down illegal online gun sales uh, last year, and we worked with them earlier this year on a terrific program to develop a new strategy to help find missing children by sending amber alerts, uh, complete with pictures and even videos of the children, directly to the mobile phones of people who are in the designated search areas. So Facebook can track every, if a child goes missing in Ronkonkoma, Long Island, the Facebook users in Ronkonkoma get the pictures and they get the amber alert in a much more complete form. So we, we developed this good relationship and we've, now we're using it in a, a way to deal with some of the trafficking issues that have really been very, very hard to, hard to handle. Our, our new partnership, and, and I think most of you know that Facebook is the world's largest social network, our new partnership is based on getting their expertise in identifying patterns in large sets of data combined with our law enforcement and investigative uh, skills and powers. Working with Facebook data engineers, my office is launching a pilot program that will deploy cutting-edge technology to identify victims of trafficking. If there are patterns in the wording of ads for potential sex trafficking victims, we will identify them. If there are patterns in the cell phone numbers or locations or other data listed in ads for potential trafficking victims, we will identify them. And if there are missing children who actually appear in ads, for sex, we will identify them and work to return them to their families. Thank you. This is, this is a pilot program. We're very excited about it, but we, we're, we're seeking to combine our law enforcement resources and expertise with Facebook's network expertise and really open a new front in the fight against online sex trafficking. We are very optimistic about this, and after we have piloted the program and hopefully successfully and, and refined our approach, uh, we hope to share it with other law enforcement partners all across the country. Um, so you can see the trajectory New York has been on. All this started less than a decade ago. A lot of work went on before that. I want to emphasize that. 
to raise awareness and raise consciousness to get us to the point where we could start passing statutes. But once we started, um, the, com the community here responded with great strength. I mean, our, I, I, am, uh, I can't say enough about our chief judge and the leadership he has provided, and he's not going to hold the position that much longer. I'm beginning to suffer sort of a post-traumatic stress disorder from thinking about him leaving. He has been the greatest partner my office and every office involved in ju the justice system could possibly have. And the work that we've done every step of the way that I've described has involved collaboration between the judiciary, members of the legislature, people in law enforcement, and the advocacy community. My office's victim-centered approach, now combined with the use of cutting-edge technology, is really just the, another step on this trajectory. It is the kind of aggressive, creative strategy that I am committed to pursuing. And I hope that others around the country will look at this and look at what we've accomplished. I hope that at this summit, we're sharing other ideas and we, my folks are here. And if there are other good ideas from other states, we want to know about them too. We've made big strides, but we still have more to do. And I think that the, uh, the victim-centered approach to this and the understanding of the fundamental shift in awareness that in my office, and we, we carry this to all the law enforcement agencies we work with all across the state, victims are treated as presumptively victims, not presumptively perpetrators. It's transformed the whole approach, and it's easy for people to understand. But we need to commit ourselves to continuing to work, to finding more creative solutions, and to ensuring that law enforcement all across America adopts this approach and shifts the frame for trafficking cases. I know that those of you who are here are committed to this transformational work, and believe me, we are committed to expanding and building on our success in New York. We're constantly seeking to add more allies in the law enforcement and criminal justice communities, and I hope you all meet as many people as possible here, start collaborations and friendships across states, sectors, and organizations. Uh, we're here to do that. And I do believe this conference in and of itself, and I, I must say I did not realize when I was invited to this, how broad the attendance would be from so many different parts of the country. I, I've never actually seen this many folks from so many different places gather together to focus on this issue. So a real uh, thank you to all those who made this possible. I will always be here working on this issue, and you can count on my office for support and, and hopefully for coming up with even more good ideas and more good innovations. We have to do it. Modern day slavery has to be stamped out and we have to bring the same determination to bear uh, that was brought in other great movements in the United States. Let's make this conference a major stepping stone towards ending human trafficking wherever and however we can. Thank you very much.